our second one, and the very, very best, because it's presented by four students from Fort Lewis College. So, as a courtesy to them, keep that big smile and shut off all the phones. Totally. Please, totally. Single <laughs> text, don't fart around underneath the table or anything like that. Give them your attention. They work with the on the line. It's just your students? Uh, any, any students? Any students. We're going to pass this around. Are you a student here, sir? No, you're not. Uh, you look like you should be. Uh, students need to sign up. We will not have a program in December and January. I've learned in the past years that you're all too busy. So our next program is February, which is March 11th. February 11th and March 11th. Great programs, as they all are. Not as good as this one. This is four times better than any program we've ever had. Um, what else do we want to talk about? Native Plant Society is open to everybody. We have trips all summer long. If you're here during the summer, they're really lots of fun. No matter what level of interest you have in plants, ooh, I just like pretty colors, ooh, I want to know the exact species. And they're free and open to everybody. You don't have to pay money. You don't have to join the group. If you want to join the group, pay money, that's fine. But you don't have to. Students, old people, young people, middle people, no matter, everybody. Um, one thing that we're looking forward to is at the end of July, and if anybody wants to get involved and participate in any way, the end of July of this uh, 2015, we're hosting the Native Plant Society annual meeting, Native Plant Society in New Mexico. We're actually part of the New Mexico Native Plant Society rather than Colorado. We're more associated with them, we're closer to Albuquerque than we are in Denver and all that. And we've got about 38 field trips planned over three days. Very interesting. Good variety of trips led by all kinds of people to all kinds of neat places. So, um, Ross, would you like to introduce a group? Uh, this is of particular interest to me. This talk tonight is more interesting to me than any other talk we've had because I say with great pride, my wife and I discovered this species. Um, here it was up a road up the Dolores Valley, up the Dolores River. Uh, lots of people go past it all the time. Nobody had ever stopped to shake its hand and say, hey, who are you? And actually, I had gone probably 15 years up that road and never noticed it. Or thought it was something else. You all know the tall one about this with bright red flowers called the Scarlet Geely. It looks very much like this, but it's all bright red or intense orange red. But one day, we just were going up there. I guess the light was just right. It's a gravel road, driving slowly, and I just kept seeing sort of flickers out of the corner of my eye. And what, what, what are those white dots I'm saying? Stopped the car, got and said, what's this? And we tried to key it out. We tried to figure out what it was. We used every book we could. Came to the conclusion, I'll tell you this for a moment, I don't know if you know this, that it was oh, certainly a new species, so we sent it this little kind of flux, pulmoniaceae. And we sent it to uh, the top two experts in flocks in the United States. Now, you can't repeat this story anymore. And they said, it's just a variation of these other ones that we know. And I thought, what? See, I don't have a PhD. I'm not biased. I don't have a PhD in botany. Now, if Ross had sent it in, they probably would have said, it's a new species. But how can a nobody find a new species? So they blew it off, and year after year we went past this place, and about four years after that happened, I said, this is not the species that they said it is. I tore the plant apart. I worked with my friend John Gregor. We looked at the tiny, every little detail of this thing, which is all beautiful, especially when you use a hand lens, a microscope. And we described it longer than any description you've probably ever seen photographed it, we sent it back to those people. This was maybe seven years after they said no, and I guess they had forgotten, and they wrote back and said, beautiful new species you discovered. <laughs> and the top botanist in Colorado did the same thing. He blew it off the first time around, and later, and I still have his email saying, what a gorgeous new species is this? So these guys have uh, looked at this plant, 
interviewed it, tickled it, walked up and down the mountainsides counting it, and the work started really with Professor Ross McCauley. I told him about the plants, and I think your area has one of the type specimens. She has a type specimen, which I think was the first type specimen here. Maybe still only the first one. A type specimen, everybody know what that is? No. Uh, it is a sample of, or the, very first specimen of the plant ever collected. But what you do is you collect now the, the standard protocol. You collect about eight of them, six of them, twelve of them, and you send them to herbaria all around the United States, maybe the Smithsonian, Missouri Botanical Garden, and you designate one of them as the the type type. It is the ultimate, and that's at the University of Colorado. We were going to put it here, but this is limited in the number of people who get here. It costs a lot of money to fly here. A lot more people go into the Denver area. So that's where the type specimen is, but we have a copy of that type here, collected in the same group, the same day, exactly the same place. Uh, so it's, it's a really neat, neat thing to do, and type specimens are valued over all others because that's the, if, if I find another plant and say, oh, it looks like this, what I do is I bring it to the herbarium here and I compare it, I compare it to the type to figure out whether it is the same species or a different one. So that's why type specimens are so important. I'll shut up, Ross, if you want to talk. Sure, thanks, Al. So as Al said, he uh, introduced me to Agrimops and Formosa a few years ago, and I thought, that's a really cool story. If you have this plant isolated in a relatively small area, and I won't say how small or how big, I'll let these guys kind of take care of this, and being an evolutionary biologist, now, this got me thinking of a particular question. Why is this thing only here in this particular small area? What about its biology makes it so unique? So these guys came along, who have all been doing their senior research with me for the last year, and they thought this was kind of a neat question too. So we designed a project that would involve multiple people looking at different aspects of the biology of this plant to try to answer this question. Why is this thing there? So we've got four students who I think have been really excited about this. Uh, lots of time in the field, lots of fun stories from being in the field. It's been great working with them over the last year on this, and it's nice to kind of see this kind of kind of come to an end, even though, as we kind of know with most research, it doesn't actually come to an end. You kind of make some progress towards your question, and then you answer, you kind of bring up a whole bunch of other questions. So this doesn't really end, but it's kind of a nice, kind of in the midpoint. Maybe not in the midpoint, maybe just a little bit, because there's so much kind of stuff about this. So I'm going to let these guys kind of go. Starting here is Stephen, and we've got Meredith, Shyla, and Melody, who are going to uh, tell us about this awesome species occurring in uh, Marine Corps Canyon. Okay, All, right. Take it away. All right, thanks for that introduction, everyone, and thanks again uh, for coming out and seeing us. It's not very often that you get to work with a brand new species, and it's also not very often that you get to work with a species that uh, is in the same home as the Earth, Southwest Colorado. So we've been really, really honored to have this opportunity to work on crops and work with Ecomopsis Formosa. So without any ado, we'll go ahead and get started. So as Al has mentioned and Ross, um, this is a brand new species and so going into this there wasn't a whole lot of background information. Um, so basically when we were devising our study we had to kind of go off what we did have. And that was that we knew that Icomopsis formosa only grew in a um, very small corridor right in between the towns of Dolores, Colorado and Rico, Colorado. We also knew that it was a biennial which means that it takes two years to reach full maturity and complete its life cycle. And uh, at full maturity, it can reach between 25 to 44 centimeters in height. Additionally, Ipomopsis formosa is very limited in uh, how it can grow and where it can grow. We can only find it in a very specific type of soil, which is referred to as the Permian Cutler Formation. Uh, additionally, Ipomopsis formosa requires lots of sunlight, so we only found it growing on south-facing slopes. Um, in addition to that, we can only find it through a very narrow elevation range, about 8,200 feet to 9,300 feet in elevation. Uh, in 
In addition to that, Ipomopsis ramosa only grows uh, or prefers to grow in areas that have been recently disturbed. So along roadsides, maybe ditches, or where grazing occurs. So with all of this information in mind, we realized that there were still a lot of holes that needed to be filled in knowledge. Uh, so we decided to form these four main focuses of study. And with those focuses, we thought we really needed to start in the beginning and figure out where exactly can we find Ipomopsis ramosa? We know that we can find a couple populations scattered here in what we've been calling the Roaring Fork, Forks area, uh, but we really wanted to figure out exactly how far and how wide this distribution extends throughout Colorado. So after examining the distribution, we thought it would be a good idea to do a phenological, phen <laughs> excuse me, phenological observation of the area and of the plant um, so we can figure out what sort of external cues cause uh, this plant to go through different stages of its life. After that, we thought it would be a good idea to uh, investigate the reproductive strategies of the plant. So plants can have very varied reproductive strategies, and by learning about them, we can learn about, a lot about the species itself. Um, so by learning how Ipomopsis formosa makes more of itself, um, we could also potentially investigate what the pollinators were, and if it did indeed need a pollinator. Disturbances. So within areas where you have animal traffic, 
traffic, or as we had described, trails, we find it wrong. And so we found it all up in these side canyons. And then right down here, side eight, this was a, uh, this area here is a uh, private land. And so you have to go across an easement into the national forest. And then we followed it up the hillside, up to here. And it, we actually went all the way up to here on the ridge line, but this whole area was forested. And Acromosis does not like shade. That is guaranteed it's not like it. And um, I'll, I'll just quick point out the number beneath the site. That is where the total count was for those locations. Pre Sculch is a completely different story. We had no grazing whatsoever. The only tracks we were able to find were the uh, bear tracks right up in here. So uh, that was a little disconcerting at first. But, um, but with that being said, this area, it's right about in this location, this is where the parking lot ends. The trail goes up to the side here, and then this used to be an old road, but it's not used anymore. And so this whole area has come back, is regrown, and this whole area right here is a very young aspen forest, no more than maybe 16 feet high. And further up the slope, slope here, you have a lot of uh, ponderosa and some, uh, some more scraggly pines. I don't know exactly which ones they were. And site, so site B had very little disturbance, and with that very, very little bit of disturbance to it, you had a very low population for the size of the square meters that were in comparison to all the other sites. And Site A was actually included in the, an earlier survey that was conducted in 2013. That, that was conducted you know, by Ross. And that leads us right into the Roaring Forest populations. So this is, I don't know, this is ground zero for where I've been off. This is the found for, for most of the time. I'm just uh, pretty like um, site H is where most of our research was done. It's a primary research site, population of 3,150, in comparison to every other site being way under that. Uh, about 1,000 being would be site A, more or less. And everything else is just you know, a few hundred, you know, several hundred, just depending on it. And uh, at site H, we have a phenological and reproductive sites, as well as pollinator studies. Now, all of this, you know, we know where it is. Just a very quick, simple presentation of maps. What can we do with it? Colorado Natural Heritage Program is where this species is currently listed. This data will be used to update it, and we'll actually send these maps off to that. And then it's also listed on the USDA Conservation Service. Besides that, there's no listing I've been able to find. Looking into different, you know, there's herbarium data, which is where, you know, for botanical species. But on the mainstream, it's not on any endangered species lists. And with the population this low, Kind of easily. So that was just something that was very well to say. And with the discovery of new populations, we can start looking at plant soil interactions, which I've not been done yet. We can start looking at um, different places we can find, uh, potential places we can further find it if it is there. And so, um, once you have a couple different things figured out about the plant, it's, sort of, it's called ecological niche modeling, you can actually start using mapping and stuff and actually model where the plant is further down the line. And, um, yeah, so at this point, I'm going to turn over everything to Meredith to tell you what a dollar is. Hi, hey everyone. Um, so, as previously stated, not a lot of baseline data have been gathered about Ipomopsis rumosa. That being said, I wanted to look into its phenology of development. So what is phenology, you ask? Well, phenology studies the main life cycle events occurring within one organism's reproductive cycle. And when you think of an organism, often we refer back to animals. And so if you were docu documenting the phenology of development in an animal, you would look at things like mating, molting, migration, hibernation patterns. But in a plant, and specifically Ipomopsis rumosa, the things that I documented were um, anthesis or flowering, bolting, rosette, and going to seed. So why is understanding phenology important to science? Well, it can, cue, it can kind of tell us uh, what type of abiotic and biotic triggers um, tend to cue this plant into moving through the life cycle events. So it can give us a better understanding of the relationship between the environment and the plant. So how did I do this? Well, this is a good visual of the spread of Site H, the one that Stephen talked about, that had a population of well over 3,000. And you can see along the bottom here some of my plots. And I set up about 20 of them. And I put 10 on the lower part of the hillside where the elevation was less. And it was closer to the road and more disturbed. And then off to the left here, 
Um, you can't see it, but it leads up the hillside. I put 10 more over here, and this allows me to um, get a broader range as far as my entire population goes. Um, I do want to point out that this site is about 20 plus miles or so from Dolores, four miles up a dirt road, and then you have to scramble up a canyon. And a lot of this research was done by ourselves, and this was both exhilarating and fun, because often I had my head in my thoughts, and I wasn't thinking about what was above me or going on around me. And on more than one occasion, I ran into um, fresh mountain lion tracks. And so needless to say, I started bringing my dog. <laughs> every week to two weeks, and I set up these plots in the exact same position that we initially started them. And I, I marked them with flags, and I numbered them. And we did 20 because often you need to have a higher number of plots and prepare for possibly losing one or two, which in the end we ended up losing two. Flags got pulled, you know, somebody nibbled on one of the plots, and um, another time one just completely dried up. So I had 20, but I ended up with about 18. So like I said, I came back every two weeks or so, and I literally set up my plots, and I looked at them, and I watched them, and I took photographs, and I made, I brought my uh, field observation book into the field with me, and I, and I just wrote what I saw, and I counted. And I looked at all the types of life events and documented them, including rosette, anthesis, bolting, um, and got to see. And I, I do want to reiterate the fact that the Ipomopsis ramosa is a biennial, meaning that the first year of its life, it's spent in an, a rosette stage, and I'll show you a photograph of that here shortly. And then the second year of its life, it'll go from rosette all the way through the rest of its phenophases. You know, phases. And so within my plot, some of my Ipomopsis ramosa species stayed in rosette stage, and others completed their entire life cycle. So this kind of gives you an idea of what I saw over the course of 110 days. Um, the very first stage that I witnessed was the rosette stage, and this is when it initially comes up from the earth. Second is bolting, it's sending its first shoot up. Third, you're going to see your first buds, and finally full anthesis or flowering when it's able to receive a pollinator and be reproductively successful. And then five, of course, gone to seed. And this just kind of gives you an overview of what my plots look like over the course of the four months. I took many more photographs, but documenting each month and kind of showing you what plot five and eight, um, this gives you a better visual. And you can see over the course of time how vegetation um, slowly moved in. It became more and more difficult to count as the, as the months progressed. So what do I do with all this information? Well, I had to quantify it. I had to take what I saw and I had to turn it into numbers and make sense of everything. And the main point that I want to make with studying the phenology of development in Ipomopsis ramosa is that the abiotic trigger that seems to signal this plant to move through its life events was water. And so along the bottom here, on the right of my graph, you will see precipitation patterns in Roaring Fork Canyon. And obviously, um, the, the higher the bar, the more rainfall we saw. And along the top, I documented the total number of individuals seen within plot, in the plots. That would be the pink line, including seed, anthesis, bolting, and rosette. And I just want to point out here, in May 10th, around May 10th, this is when we first went out to the site, and the soil was really saturated. I mean, the snow had melted, and we're pretty high up there. We're about, what, 8,000 feet or so? So the snow had just melted, and this seems to be the first trigger that tells the plants it's time for me to start, start getting going. You know, let's start growing. Let's do this. And so as we move through the months here, you can see the precipitation patterns um, dwindle and that water availability becomes scarce. And right around in June, um, this seemed to be another trigger to the plant that said, oh my gosh, I'm running out of water. I need to send up a bolt and start flowering because I want to be reproductively successful and pass on my genetic material and essentially make babies. And so you'll see through here, right around the dry area, is corresponds with our anthesis and bolting. Now in July, a lot of you guys will recognize this pattern as the monsoon season, when our rains move in. And interestingly enough, our rosettes plummeted. They plummeted right around the time that we ran out of water. But here, we got an influx 
influx of rain. The precipitation pattern skyrocketed. And it should be noted that I saw a second spike in rosettes. So what does that mean? I mean, a rosette is just a little guy. It's just a seedling. Why would this come up at the end of the year? Well, I think what happened is it got that trigger that said, you know, I've got the resources to keep going. And so essentially all the little seedlings that didn't germinate at this part of the year um, got a second cue to do exactly that. And for that reason, I saw that spike here at the end. So basically, as far as the phenology of development is concerned, the main abiotic trigger and the takeaway that you need to take from this part of the presentation is that it seems to move through these life cycle events based on precipitation patterns. So with that being said, we had other big research questions that we wanted to examine. So I'm going to turn it over to Shyla and let her go into that a little bit further. Thank you, Meredith. You're welcome. All right. Um, so great. This one is back to some of our questions. Why is Iconopsis ramosa limited to only this region? And it's actually not uncommon for certain for some plants to be limited in their distribution based on reproductive um, based on reproductive limitations. And so, for example, maybe Echinopsis ramosa doesn't have a good pollinator. Maybe it doesn't even have a pollinator. Um, maybe there's some kind of unique feature that it has in the way that it reproduces that might be limiting its reproduction. So, what could this be? What's actually limiting its reproduction? What I was trying to find out over the summer was how this plant reproduced. And then when I figured out what breeding system it used, um, I, was gonna, I was trying to see how that affected the final fruit set and the seeds that were produced in there as well. And in case we don't all remember, let's go over how plants reproduce. Um, <laughs> so most, most people know of plants that reproduce through a pollinator. And um, just when, they, when one animal comes to a flower and it takes its um, pollen and deposits on another. This is called outcrossing or cross-pollination. And plants can all actually self-fertilize as well. Um, they can do this by um, <laughs> just getting their own pollen on their own stigma. And this can happen on the same flower. And it can also happen in between any of the flowers that are on the same inflorescence. Um, there are two different ways that selfing can happen, and some of the most common ways are actually through external agents. And these are mainly not adaptive ways that were developed by the plant um, in the beginning. Gynonomy is when um, a pollinator will bring the pollen of that same plant to other flowers on that plant, causing self-fertilization. And facilitated selfing happens because of the pollinator as well, because sometimes when they're feeding, it's hard for them not to get that plant's pollen on its own stigma. And these are more adaptive ways that plants self-fertilize. Prior self-fertilizing happens before the flower even opens, and when the anthers let all their pollen go and the stigmas are receptive um, early. And then delayed selfing is kind of the same as facilitated selfing, but it's not mediated by a pollinator. It just happens at the end of the anthesis when the movement of a plant might cause it to fertilize itself where it wasn't previously cross-fertilized. And some of the advantages of self-fertilization could include um, reproductive assurance. It can be less, it can be um, reproductively less, metabolically less costly. And then it can also help you um, have the potential for a little adaption. And then when you think about the bad parts about this, if you're continuously taking genetic material from yourself, you are eventually going to have some limitations. Um, and these can lead to, this can lead to problems with fertility and survival. And then outcrossing is our, is our second breeding system. Um, and this just happens, this is when plants are pollinated by another plant, or through pollinator mutation. Um, and this is mostly good just because of the genetic diversity, which can help with the resilience of the species. And then the only bad part about this is that maybe a pollinator is not always around. So how did I go about trying to figure out how Ipomopsis ramosa reproduces? Um, well, in June, I went up there and I found 30 individuals that hadn't um, opened yet, so it was prior to anthesis. 
And I split that group in half. So there were 15 in each of my groups. And one half I left alone to leave as a control. And the other half I bagged with a mesh that was one millimeter size so that no pollinators would be able to um, touch any of the flowers. And then throughout the summer, um, I, I went back and I counted each of the flowers that were on each inflorescence. And when it, when it got later in the summer, around June, um, I saw that groups were being produced. And when they started to mature, I clipped them. And then I took them back here to the lab so I could count their flowers and the fruits that they produced. And this is what I found. Um, as you can see, they really produced a lot of flowers. Um, there were up to maybe 150 flowers on some of those inflorescences. And it was, what you should really notice here is that our, our control population, it produced fruits just fine. And our bag population, it had almost nothing produced. And then also when we were counting, there were about three seeds in each of the fruits. And this is just another way to look at this. Um, this is the proportions, which I turned into percentages. And if you're looking at this, the median of our bag population is only a 0.768. And that's, that's really low. And I have a feeling that it's, it's not at zero, because I probably had some sort of error in the way that I put the bags on, because I did find a few fruits on one of my flowers, or on one of my inflorescences. And I think that I might have just not put my bag tight enough that somebody was able to squeeze in there. <laughs> and um, when I, and the unbagged median is at 50%. And then when I, I ran these through non-parametric tests, and they turned out to be very statistically different. Um, so what exactly does that tell us? It tells us that Ipomopsis formosa does not fertilize itself, so therefore it's not limited by its reproduction. Um, and what this is called when a plant needs a pollinator is obligate outcrossing. So Meredith, would you be so kind to tell us more about this? So now that we know that Ipomopsis formosa needs an external pollinator, we have to go about identifying it. And let me tell you guys, this was the fun part. <laughs> This is our lovely reenactment of what we did in the herbarium. And I have to tell you, it's actually pretty similar to this. I want everybody to imagine four biology students scrambling over a hillside, nets ablaze, trying to just kind of capture anything that touched one of our Ipomopsis remoses. And this took a lot of stealth and speed and patience and many hours in the field just watching. So if we saw a pollinator come up to our plant and physically insert itself, we went after it. And we tried to catch it. And we, we actually did pretty well. Um, but I want to say we were upwards of 20 plus hours just sitting out there um, watching it. It was, it was a lot of fun. So what did we find? On the left here, we have the Papilia rutilis, or the Western Tiger Swallowtail. Many of you guys might recognize this one. You've seen it around in maybe your gardens here in town. And it should be noted that this is a generalist, which means that it doesn't necessarily pollinate only the Ipomopsis rumosa. It prefers other plant specimens as well. And some of the other plant specimens that it prefers are things like thistle. These were observed on our hillside. Um, another important thing to recognize about the tiger swallowtail is that it has one migratory flight pattern, and that exists between June and July, right here. So you see it, and then you don't. And of all our time in the field, we only saw the tiger swallowtail one time, and we were only able to catch one specimen. So I thought that was really interesting, and keep that in mind, because we're going to talk a little bit about it later. And then on the right here, we have the Hylias lineata. And this guy is similar to a helicopter. It is fast and it's really hard to catch. And so the very first time that we caught it, I was just like jumping with ju like joy. It was really exciting. Lots of whoops across the hillside of Coons or the canyon, you know. All that jubilance. But this is known as the hummingbird moth, and it's also a generalist, and it has a pretty wide range as well. And we saw it through the course of the end of the summer. And this correlates with the endothesis in the phenology of development as well of the flower. And so we saw this one um, for quite a while. We were able to capture quite a few specimens. And it should be noted that it tends to be active mainly in the cooler parts of the day. So um, 6 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> evenings, and also at nighttime when, we, when you know, it's hard to really see. And once again, as a generalist, it prefers other specimens of plants as well, including 
combine and larkspur and thistle and other things that we observed on there. So what do we do with this information? Well, we did physically see it pollinate the Ipomopsis grumosa, but we really needed to confirm that. So we took our specimens back to the lab and we extended the proboscis of the Hylaeus lineata and we dragged it through a medium and we placed it under a microscope. And as a generalist, we saw different types of pollen grains because, you know, it was pollinating things other than Ipomopsis grumosa. So we took those pollen grains and then we took pollen from an Ipomopsis grumosa plant that we had in the herbarium and we compared them under a microscope. And in this way, we were able to see that there was indeed um, Ipomopsis formosa pollen on the Hylaeus lineata, confirming that it was indeed one of our vector pollinators. Now, I would have loved to do this with the tiger swallowtail. Unfortunately, when we tried to do so, um, the proboscis was gone, and we had only caught one tiger swallowtail. So I'm a little bit bummed about that. What are the two? Um, so it's varying degrees of um, Yeah, of, of focus. So this is, it, basically you just focus it in out so you can kind of get an idea of what the outside of the palm grain looks like and um, the grain and texture of it. So it's just two different photographs at varying degrees. So what do we do with this information? Well, now that we know who the vector pollinator is, or at least one of them, um, we wanted to examine how pollen movement occurred on the side and between the populations. And I'm going to let Shaka Melanie talk a little bit about that. So, as Meredith mentioned, uh, we had identified these two pollinators that were working very hard to pollinate Ipomopsis ramosa, but also, as she mentioned, these were two generalist species. So, we knew that they weren't going to be isolated to just Ipomopsis ramosa. Uh, because of that, we really needed a way to quantify exactly how much uh, <coughs> possible genetic sharing was going on between Ipomopsis ramosa and other species of Ipomopsis. So we also not only needed to find a way to figure out the degree of genetic exchange, but also find a way to supplement our observations that we have made because uh, our highly zoniato pollinator is active only during dusk and dawn and times of low visibility. So we really needed some sort of data to kind of supplement the things that we couldn't see very well. So that's where I came in with the pollen analog study. And we used a fluorescent pigment and this pigment was a powder. And what was unique about this powder was it had the same texture and characteristics as pollen. So we could actually place the dye on a flower, and then as a pollinator came and visited that one flower there, uh, we could then see each plant that it visited subsequently because it would leave this deposition of fluorescent pigment. So, this was a great way to provide a visual tracker for any uh, pollination that occurred between Ipomopsis ferosa and Ipomopsis aggregata. And it also, again, provided us with that data to supplement our observations. So, uh, what we did here was we applied the pigment onto the anthers of a selected plant. We called these the dye source individuals. And for each trial that we did, we would have two dye source individuals. One would be the Ipomopsis ramosa, painted one color, and then the other would be the aggregata species, painted a separate color. So after painting the animals of these flowers, we would vacate the area for 24 hours and uh, let the pollinators do their thing. When we came back after waiting, uh, it was then dusk and we could shine a black light on each flower of each plant within a seven meter radius and track all the movement that had gone on between the species. And this took quite a bit of time. I mean, Shiloh was mentioning that each plant could have up to 150 flowers, and we were looking at hundreds of flowers. So it was actually quite labor intensive, but still pretty fun. So we chose two sites to do this study at. Uh, the first one is down here, the Roaring Fork site, and that was in a pretty similar location to where Meredith did her phenology exam and Shyla did her bagging study. Um, one thing to be noted about this area was that it was dominantly Ipomopsis ramosa, and these were pretty dense clusters, with that Ipomopsis aggregata kind of few and far between, scattered throughout the population. The second 
site, which is this very small yellow dot with a giant orange arrow, was the Wildcat Creek site. And that was the opposite. It was dominantly Ipomoxis aggregata with fewer Ipomoxis mimosa. So again, uh, we selected these sites with two main things in common. So they had to have the two species growing together. And when we selected the dye source individuals, we made sure to select plants that were in central locations. And if we were uh, picking, say, a species of, or a sample of Ipomopsis ramosa, we wanted to make sure it was directly close to an aggregata. Because we were trying to pressure the pollinators to pollinate the two different species if they were at all inclined to do so. So, what were our results? Uh, these first two boxes here represent trials down at the Roaring Fork site. And as you can see, we mostly see uh, intraspecific pollen movement. So usually it was that ramosa pollinating ramosa or aggregata pollinating aggregata. We did see some incidents where there was interspecific movement. So we would see the aggregata's pigment found on one ramosa. And that was the same trend we saw in the second trial. And then also in our third trial, down at the Roaring Forks area. Now, at Wildcat Creek, we started to see a slightly different pattern. Um, instead of seeing the aggregata moving to the ramosa, we instead saw the ramosa moving to the aggregata. But in general, it was still kind of the same thing, mostly all the same species interacting, and then just one reported incidence per trial of interspecific. So what does this interspecific movement mean? Well, unfortunately for our big question, it did mean that we couldn't necessarily blame just the pollinator for any species segregation that we saw with the Ipomopsis ramosa. And we did see a slightly different pattern in the two study sites. What we think that has to do with was, again, that dominant vegetation. So as I mentioned before, uh, the Ipomopsis ramosa was more common in the Roaring Forks area and the aggregata at the Wildcat Creek area. And so basically what we are thinking is the most dominant species was the one that was getting pollinated most often. So because we can't necessarily blame uh, the pollinators for any, or excuse me, for any <coughs> genetic isolation, uh, we have to look at some other means for what could have caused the speciation of Ipomopsis ramosa. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the four morphology, and then we'll also have to look maybe to uh, some phylogenetics to figure out exactly where these origins can lie. So for the floral morphology, we basically went ahead and collected floral samples of each species, the aggregata and the ramosa, and brought them back to the lab and made some basic measurements. And for those of you who are a little rusty on your floral morphology, I've provided a diagram right here. So if you look at this top graph up here, that is measuring the length of the floral tube. And so uh, you can see with the ramosa represented in pink here, that it is significantly shorter in floral tube than the aggregata. And that's a trend we tend to see throughout the rest of the measurements as well. So if you check out the stamen length over here, the ramosa is significantly shorter than the aggregata. And one thing to note about the positioning of the stamens is that they were very inserted. So we've got this diagram here. Uh, this would be kind of an accurate representation of what the aggregata would look like with the stamens and the pistils fully exerted out of the floral tube. With the aggregata, we would probably see these things located much farther down. Uh, so you couldn't quite see them in the floral tube without dissecting it. And then, last but not least, we saw the same trends with the pistol length as well. Significantly shorter, and then also fully inserted in the floral tube. So, what could this all mean, and how can floral morphology help with speciation? Well, I'm going to pose a scenario for everyone. Uh, this is our friend here, Hadley's Liniata. And let's say the hummingbird moth were to come and uh, pollinate, or just visit, Ipomopsis aggregata. When it sticks its long proboscis into the floral tube, it will brush up against these stamens and get pollen distributed and stuck onto its proboscis at relatively the same height 